Welcome, I'm your host, Neil Howard, here on Health Professional Radio. Glad that you could join us once again in conversation with Dr. Phil Dormitzer. He's VP and CSO, Viral Vaccines at Pfizer. And he's joining us on the program to talk about some significant new data that was presented at the 2019 ID Week, or Infectious Disease Week conference there in Washington, D.C., for an RSV vaccine. Welcome to the program, Dr. Dormitzer. Uh, thanks. I'm glad to be here. VP and CSO of Viral Vaccines at Pfizer. Uh, briefly, uh, give us a, a bit of background and talk about your role there at Pfizer as VP of Viral Vaccines. Uh, the basic role is to uh, discover uh, and develop uh, and license uh, uh, new vaccines against viruses. Infectious Disease Week, this conference that was held there in in Washington, D.C., how often are you presenting at this uh, conference? Is this something that you've been doing for quite a while? Um, I have not. Uh, I think Pfizer shows up there pretty much uh, every year. Uh, but uh, this is the first time I've presented there, and I was part of a team, and we actually presented a couple of posters there. So there, there were a number of team members there. Briefly for our listeners, what is RSV? So RSV stands for respiratory syncytial virus. And it is a virus that causes respiratory illness, obviously, but it affects to the greatest degree uh, infants in their very first weeks of life. In fact, the peak of disease is at about six weeks of age. And it causes a characteristic disease called bronchiolitis. And that's when the small airways uh, of the lung get into for infants to breathe. It also, again, causes illness when people are elderly. And in the elderly, illnesses often triggering exacerbations of underlying pulmonary disease. So you say often in the in the elderly, normally in children, uh, in infants, are there any instances uh, in between, say in, in the early teens or early uh, or later adolescent? So we're probably infected with RSV in the sort of prime of young adulthood. It tends to be less symptomatic, although when, for example, parents are exposed to very large amounts of RSV from their children, they probably do get some symptoms. But it's, it's worse in the babies because they have tiny airways, that, and a tiny airway is harder to push air through. And so when those little airways get inflamed, it can become very difficult to push air through them, especially if you've got you know, little baby uh, respiratory muscles. And then, again, in the elderly, it becomes a problem because so many of them have underlying illnesses, and there may be some immunosenescence as well with, with, with waiting immunity. So at either extreme of the age infection, uh, age spectrum, you get more disease, although the infection probably occurs frequently throughout our lives. Now, is this something that infants have ever been able to, to grow out of, dodge, or what is the treatment uh, once the, they're diagnosed? So RSV is incredibly common. Uh, essentially, everybody gets it mm-hmm. by the age of two. In some cases, the disease is mild, or in some cases, they don't even have symptoms, but others, it's very severe. And when it is severe, there is no really practical treatment for it that is specific. Instead, uh, what you have is supportive care, uh, assisting infants with their breathing. If they uh, often they get dehydrated, because when they can't breathe, it's very hard to nurse. So giving them fluids. And and to give you an idea about just how common it is, globally there are about 33 million cases of RSV annually in children under five years of age. And it causes, actually, in the first year of life, about 16 times as many hospitalizations of children uh, as does influenza. So it's very common. We've all had it if we're adults. Um, And at the moment, there's only supportive care as a practical measure to treat it. Pfizer's working on a vaccine. Uh, You presented information uh, on this vaccine at the 2019 ID Week conference there in D.C. Uh, Talk about this vaccine. Um, Where is it as far as development is concerned? Okay. So we are uh, really in the thick of the clinical development of this vaccine. Uh, The data that we presented uh, at the uh, conference was from the first in human trial. That was a phase one, two trial. Um, It was a a large trial with about 1,182 healthy, non-pregnant adults. And we immunized them. Uh, uh, Some received placebo, some received different doses of of the vaccine. And we looked uh, at their uh, immune responses. Now, we've progressed since then. And now we are currently in a trial in pregnant women uh, where where we will be looking at the responses in the pregnant women and also at how well the antibody gets transferred to their babies will also be for syncytial virus disease 
um, during during their uh, the first part of life. Now, are any of these uh, subjects were they in the first in the first trial with the, with non pregnant women who were going to become pregnant or thought that they might, or are we talking in this trial uh, women who are already pregnant? How how were they uh, chosen? So, for the first trial, we specifically selected. Uh, men and women, and the women we selected were not pregnant. And by the way, we selected a wide age range. We tested the vaccine in people from 18 to 85 years of age. And for that trial, uh, we actually wanted uh, 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 women to be on unaffected modes of contraception because we didn't want to start testing pregnant women until we had already done the evaluation um, in non-pregnant subjects. And then with that data, data and the very good safety that we saw, then we've gone on to now start to the testing in pregnant women. Um, basically, because RSV strikes so early in life, uh, it's too early to really immunize effectively. Uh, to immunize against a disease that peaks at six weeks of age, you don't have enough time to get in a couple of doses, and you're also dealing with an infant's immature immune system. So instead, we'll be immunized. And then the way the baby gets pregnant, that the mother makes gets transferred across the placenta to the fetus. So when the baby is born, the baby already has uh, antibodies, antibodies that can kill the virus, uh, already already on board. That means that the higher the antibody response in the mother, the higher the antibody will be born with, or higher the antibody tighter the baby will be born with, and the more protection. What's exciting about the results is that histamines against RSV have typically elicited maybe oh, three, if you're very lucky, fourfold rises in neutralizing antibodies in the subjects. We were seeing 10 to 20 fold rises. So we we're seeing much greater increases in neutralizing antibodies uh, in these non pregnant subjects, which gives us, you know, you know, also see similar rises in antibodies in pregnant subjects, and therefore their babies are likely to be born with higher antibody titers as well. Now, you're also working on some other uh, maternal immunity therapies. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. We, we also have a program on group B streptococcus, which is another leading cause of infant morbidity and mortality worldwide. Uh, which has, has limited treatment approaches. So, so for that, we're actually uh, uh, working with a, a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We're also in phase two studies um, uh, in, in both non-pregnant and pregnant women um, in that study as well. Why are you so excited about, about this data personally? Well, you know, it's particularly exciting that the, the response that we see to the vaccine is built off of some really exciting science. Uh, for many years, people have been trying to make RSV vaccines, and they've gotten these relatively uh, modest responses. And then the NIH made a critical discovery in uh, about 2013. They determined the crystal structure of the form of, of the key antigen of the vaccine, called the f protein, that's actually on the virus. That antigen actually changes its shape into a uh, form that is much less able to elicit antibodies spontaneously because... It's actually a molecule that's designed to change shape as it helps the virus under cells. And what the NIH discovered was that the pre-fusion form of the molecule, which is the form that's on the virus that elicits the most potent antibodies, can be stabilized through structural engineering using clues from the structure that they discovered. And then Pfizer scientists used that structure to engineer a very stable pre-fusion form and that seems to be what made the difference in eliciting much higher antibody titers. It, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, and I'm hoping that we'll uh, get an opportunity to talk again once these trials advance, okay? That would be great. Uh, thank you. Learn more at Pfizer.com, that's P-F-I-Z-E-R.com, and IDWeek.org, I-D-W-E-E-K dot O-R-G. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Transcripts and audio of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, listen in, download it, SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.